With the demise of the Soviet Union, economic support for Cuba also dissolved. This caused hardship for ordinary Cubans who confronted serious rationing on top of the continued U.S. embargo. I met Cubans in the doorways of their lives and saw family, community, and revolutionary resolve everywhere. This was called the Special Period. Here are family groups in Santa Clara. They are gathering and preparing for a community fiesta. Just after I made this photo, I was offered a swig of very strong Cuban rum from the bottle cap. Three generations of Santa Clara women on their doorstep. In Santiago de Cuba, a future mother said, if it's a girl, Fidelia, a boy, Fidel. The rumba capital of the world is Santiago de Cuba. Here, I meet families at their doorways. Pioneros, or pioneers, greet me near Sibonet. At the San Juan Hill battle site, a young couple pose for me. I meet the worker in charge of the cemetery and crypt for Jose Marti in Santiago de Cuba. Now in Havana's old city, here is an artist and in his studio. Stuccoing his home, I startled him and his daughters laughed. This is a Santeria ceremony. The woman practitioner later coated me with cigar smoke and flower petals giving me a protective full-body shield against President George Herbert Walker Bush. The new revolutionary Sandinista government promised the people three things. Literacy for all, cradle-to-grave health care, and some ownership of land and the means of production. In a Managua barrio, I lived and worked with fellow New York construction volunteers. It was during this time in 1984 that we saw local organized defense in the face of realistic threats of U.S. invasion. During this period, I journeyed to Nicaragua's Atlantic coast and met with indigenous communities there. Here is an elder in Masaya who said he had fought with Sandino in the 1930s against the invading U.S. Marines. Hermine holds the photo of her son who was killed in the 1979 Sandinista insurrection against the U.S.-backed Somoza dictatorship. A new baby boy in the barrio Edgar Munguia, Managua. After teaching literacy in the countryside for six months, on return to Managua, the 16-year-olds were awarded with the right to vote. In 1984, President Reagan threatened invasion of Nicaragua. The barrio mustered defense teams and we dug foxholes in preparation. On the Rio Escondido, heading to the Atlantic coast, I meet women washing their clothes in the shallows. Sherman Bendless, 94 years old in Bluefields, said that he learned to play baseball from the invading U.S. Marines during the 1912 Banana Wars. Down the coast from Bluefields at Rama K, I meet Rama Chief Rufino, his mother and his daughter. Here, an indigenous Rama family, the man holds his manatee fishing blowgun. Welcome Wilson is a mosquito. He said it takes him two weeks to carve a mahogany canoe like this one. This is a mosquito family, including their twins. On Corn Island, the Nicaraguan Caribbean, 
I meet an English-speaking Moravian family. Mercedes Morales lost her son, Jonathan Gonzalez, to the Somoza National Guard in the 1979 Sandinista insurrection. At the height of the troubles in the 1970s and 1980s, sectarian violence hardened the neighborhoods of Derry and Belfast in defined ghettos. The Royal Ulster Constabulary, the British Army, and Protestant militias were determined to secure their union with the United Kingdom, just as the IRA was determined to end British rule and unify all of Ireland. Derry schoolgirls and boys greet me, exactly at the site of the Bloody Sunday. In the Catholic Bogside neighborhood of Derry, young people show me their favorite LP. In the Belfast Catholic Ardoin area, a school playground. Here, men play cards nearby. As I stand on the land that our mothers fought on At the hard border with the Irish Republic near Derry, traveling people negatively called tinkers would cross to acquire free medical care in the north. Catholic boys playing in the rubble, West Belfast. And Protestant boys playing near Ulster Volunteer Force Graffiti, Shankill Road area. Here are Protestant women lawn bowling near the Crumlin Road area. A British Army patrol passes in Belfast city center. Away from the troubles, here is a farmer family in the Derry countryside. Ten years after the end of the American war in Vietnam, the country was in continued recovery. My visit was with a team of returning U.S. combat veterans, returning boat people, adopted Vietnamese American teenagers, and war resistors. Tourism had not yet begun. A street scene in coastal Da Nang City. In Hanoi, U.S. combat veterans meet with a North Vietnamese Army veteran, all of whom had fought in the same battle in 1969. Soldiers on a break in Queen Yong, a coastal city. Amerasian teenagers follow me in Ho Chi Minh City. Did I know their fathers? One holds his father's military ID card. Near the Kuchi tunnels, children greet me at a downed U.S. helicopter. A young woman poses at the Ho Chi Minh Mausoleum in Hanoi. Heading west near the Laotian border, we enter ethnic Hmong villages. Near Dien Bien Phu, the site of the defeat of the French forces, I meet a Hmong elder who fought the French in May 1954. Later, he survived the U.S. carpet bombing during the late 1960s. Agent Orange birth defects were evident in Orphanage No. 4 in Ho Chi Minh City. At the Children's Hospital, Ho Chi Minh City, we meet separated, conjoined twins, Duk and Viet. Young gondoliers use ferry taxis made from U.S. jet aircraft refuse. The Perfume River at Hawaii City. The international boycott and divestment campaigns against the apartheid South African regime was having an effect. Nelson Mandela had just been released from the Robben Island prison and the regime's days were numbered. A new democracy of truth and reconciliation was on the horizon. I could feel the spirit of hope and promise in the black townships. A mandla, which means power, is the greeting in Kyalisha, a township near Cape Town. In Port Elizabeth Township, a young mother and her children offer me a hard-boiled egg. This is a circumcision hut with three boys who at 18 recover from, with counseling from their elders, the Eastern Cape. 
Near East London, a couple stands at their flooded home. Also in the Eastern Cape, the Fengu people hear about the prospects of returning to their ancestral lands from which they had been forcibly removed 20 years earlier. Here, a welcome in the Tecosa Township near Johannesburg. In Richmond, Natal province, a young girl stands near white racist political party graffiti. A Zulu teacher instructs her class and then leads them singing what was to become the new national anthem in Kosi Sikileli, Africa. The South African army demolished and forcibly removed the entire community of Ivory Park. A young mother weeps and another is defiant. The first Intifada, or uprising, was essentially a non-violent resistance to the Israeli occupation of the West Bank and Gaza Strip. During this time and later, I made visits to the Palestinian refugee camps in the West Bank, Gaza, Lebanon, and Syria. Everywhere, I heard stories of life in pre-1948 Palestine and saw four generations of the world's longest unresolved refugee population. At the Dead Sea near Jericho, men play the oud, the ney, the tabla, and they dance. Abdel Jawad Jabber and his grandson welcomed me to their home in the Bekka Valley near Hebron. A survivor mother and her daughter in the Shatila camp, Beirut. Suad remains paralyzed after a rape and a bullet lodged in her spine from the September 1982 Shatila massacre. And a double amputee survivor from the same Shatila massacre. A mother holds the photos of her husband and son killed in September 1982, the Shatila massacre. Now, in the Palestinian Yarmouk camp near Damascus, Syria, I meet three generations of refugees at their doorstep. In Gaza, at the Berej camp, a refugee family. Abdul Abdullah, English teacher in the Gaza Jabalia camp, stands with his student whose arm had been smashed by Israeli soldiers for throwing stones. Abdul is the same age as the Nakba, the catastrophe of 1948. In the Gaza Shati refugee camp, this is Huda Manur, whose eye was shot out by a soldier's rubber bullet when she was 14 months old. A 1948 refugee in the Burj al barajne camp near Beirut. In the Nar el barig camp, Tripoli, Lebanon, a teacher and her students. This family was forcibly removed from their home minutes before so that soldiers could use it as an observation post. Halhul, West Bank. Here are African-Palestinian men called Guardians of the Mosque, the African quarter, Old City, Jerusalem. Abu Saleh holds the key to his home in Akko, historic Palestine, from which he fled in 1948. Ein El-Hilwe Camp, Lebanon. He said, it was all the fault of the British. A 1948 refugee in the Rashadia camp, Lebanon. Zahur Al-Atrash tells of her family's helm demolition and the uprooting of their olive trees. Jebel al sendas near Hebron. In the Bekka Valley near Hebron, Rodena Jabber and her son Ra'id stand at the tent beside their demolished home. Occupation forces said they didn't have land ownership papers. Abdel Jawad Jabber points to his son's demolished house, Bekaa Valley, West Bank. 